Okay, this is uh, going to be uh, starting off a mission to Duna using one of my interplanetary rockets. Uh, this particular rocket, um, let's see if I can find it. Interplanetary bus. Inter interplanet bus. Yeah, that's it. Uh, the interplanet bus is exactly what it says. It's to bus supplies. Uh, but the, this one's actually going to be starting a, a little science station uh, planned to put in orbit. And uh, I've got a little docking docking hub connected to it. Another docking uh, ring. Uh, one of the things that you have to remember about these docking rings is uh, the this little hub thing. Uh, docking rings do not come attached and make sure they're facing the right direction. Uh, the rest of the craft is uh, pretty basic. I may have put more parachutes than I need but I'd like these guys to really be able to... Um, I guess I could probably do well with four but I put, I put eight. Uh, also put some uh, gravimetric sensors, uh, some solar panels just in case, uh, some batteries. Um, probably should put some batteries on the capsule itself before I go. And actually, I think that'll be plenty of battery power because I'll be able to. The only time I'm going to decouple from here is when I re-enter. Carbon. Um, I've decided to have a main tank surrounded by so several auxiliary tanks with some R RCS thrusters and monopropellant tanks. Uh, reinforce it with some struts, probably a little too more than I needed to, but I want this thing to be pretty much solid when, as it's lifting off. Also added RCS uh, monopropellant on the actual station and uh, two gigantic, uh, what are those called? Uh, always like to know the names. Gigantor XL solar arrays, which are, I think that's more than enough power for the science, science station, but I plan on adding more, so as you can see. So, uh, got all the things staged. I got a typical uh, asparagus uh, sub-assembly that I've uh, assembled uh, and have tested out uh, that basically has uh, asparagus staging. Uh, you might find uh, videos that will tell you how to set these up. They're pretty straightforward. Uh, you really need to know. The main thing is you need to put in the fuel uh, lines in a certain sequence and then you got to set your decouplers at, at the same sequence so that when when as the fuel runs out uh, you can drop the tanks that are out of fuel and lighten the load a little bit. Uh, this is the first time I'm testing this craft so I'm not sure exactly how stable it's going to be. I don't know if this is enough uh, structural stress to reinforce uh, this particular area, which I'm concerned about. So I stitched together uh, the where the docking ports are, uh, and I plan to. Uh, of course, they'll disappear when you decouple, so it's not really a. Uh, they don't. The struts don't stay there, and they don't prevent the decoupling. So we're going to go ahead and go for launch on this one. Probably spent more time discussing the craft than I really needed to. And here we are launching at night, and we're going to turn on SAS and ignition. Uh, and already. There's a significant amount of instability in the craft, and there's the reason. The decoupler on the capsule is not strong enough for the forces involved. So it's the engines are gimbling to try to make up for the, you know, and then so this oscillation is just going to get worse and worse until the top end of the craft basically decouples from the bottom half um, and of course even if you were to make it this is not the way to this this is not the way to um, to start off a mission 
So we're going to go ahead and we're going to go back to the settings because I probably need to turn off, turn down the audio on this so that you guys can hear me talk. And so we're going to go ahead and revert the flight back to assembly. And uh, there's a pretty easy, pretty easy way to fix this problem, at least uh, what I've always used. On this uh, particular, this is where the weak point is. What you want to do is you want to find the ES, EAS4 strut connector. Um, set the symmetry mode. And essentially what you want to do is stitch the um, stitch around this decoupler. I think that's probably enough, actually. And uh, we're going to go ahead and try that again. So you notice I put nuclear rockets on the, around the final stage. Nuclear rockets are extremely efficient and they don't burn as much fuel. Uh, however, their thrust is not, I mean, it's, it's not a, it's not something you'd want to, uh, necessarily, you wouldn't want on a launch, but, uh, definitely for, you know, in the vacuum of space, they're pretty efficient and they're probably your best choice for return, uh, trip from Duna. We're gonna go ahead and turn the throttle up, turn on SAS. Um, and a uh, little, we're seeing more stability. And it's still wobbling. Well, this is still not the way to start a mission. This, there's just a lot of weight on the top end of this craft. Yeah. Let's see if we turn down the throttle a little bit, but that's not really going to help. We could try turning off SAS. And it's still wobbling a little too much. Okay, so again, it's the first time I'm testing this assembly, and it may be that uh, we just have too much weight on this uh, trying to head off into orbit here. Um, so the next thing to try, uh, again, turn the symmetry all the way up on this one because I have I happen to have eight engines. And so we... Oh, that's not what I wanted. And I'm going to control Z. And there we go. Yes, you can use control Z. Now let's see if a, well, that's not quite what I wanted either. So control Z. And this is still not working. Let's see if this works. Nope. The engines are blocking the um let's see if it'll control them. Um, well so this seem to be in a bit of a pickle here. Uh, can I attach to the nozzles themselves? Let's see if we can Try, let's see if this works. Yep, there we go. Uh, might try the other way, just for good measure. Uh, as long as it doesn't cross or touch the engine, I think it should work. And the next thing we're going to want to do is, since this may be part of the wobbling that's causing the problems, Let's go ahead and add some extra strut connectors to the uh, between the science and the rest of the command module. Yeah, so that's a little unorthodox, but I mean it's whatever it takes. To, and the strut connectors will go away when you decouple; they just vanish. So this should work. 
and we're nine minutes in on our second round, third round of testing. Wobbly ships are not the way to start out a mission. Mm. Hmm. And uh, go ahead and go ahead and turn up the throttle. And here we go. Yep. Significantly more s stable, less wobble. And we're ready to actually start this mission. So as you know, notice the liquid fuel the furthest, the engines that are the furthest out in the train of the, t the last out on the connection the fuel lines uh, are going to run out first and those are going to be the first to be discarded. And there's a way to prevent that explosion uh, by setting a small thrusters on the side of the on, on the side of the boosters uh, however the timing to run the amount of fuel uh, unfortunately runs out the amount of fuel that goes to those thrusters so they're inoperative and if you and if you try to ditch the boosters while they're still going um, they will um, collide into the top half of the craft so once you reach an altitude of about 10,000, you need to start turning uh, for interplanetary transfer to Duna. You'll need to turn in a bearing of 270, which from this view is to the left. So that's when you want to start your gravity turn. I usually try to pitch down about 20 degrees, 30 degrees. 45 degrees. At this point, ditch the other two boosters and watch them explode. Uh, sometimes when the boosters explode, they take out the center engine. Uh, like I said, it's there are always risks in space flight, but there's a way to mitigate that by either t shutting off the engines with X and then starting them back up after you ditch the boosters. Or you can do like I do and load from a hit F5 and when they fail, hit F9 and restart from where you left off. So we're going to check the trajectory. Still at very low right now, so we need, we need a considerable amount bit more delta V to get us into the uh, low earth or, or low carbon orbit. So these engines will burn for a long time, but, but you need to make sure that you get up to at least about 1500 or 1700 meters per second in order to escape carbon uh, gravity. So you'll see the parabolic orbit extend as these um, engines begin to, to run their course. And here's the final stage. That engine probably took a little bit of damage, but we're going to be getting rid of it soon. So.
you know, some velocity picking up. And it looks like we're getting closer to the orbit we need. However, it's a little low. It's a bit low from for comfort. So I'm going to pitch up a little bit to see if I can extend the duration to the time to apoapsis, which is the highest point. Because once that prograde marker goes below the horizon, uh, it's very difficult to keep the. You, that means you more or less pass the apoapsis. As long as you're before the apoapsis, you can continue to extend the orbit. And really, this orbit, the, I, since it's an interplanetary, there's no reason why this sort of thing can't extend all the way up to 100. But it'll probably run out before it hits 80. And there goes the final liquid. I'll check my staging here. And kick off the next stage for final round, rounding out. And let me check the. Looks like we've got a complete orbit in place. The periapsis needs to go above 80 or 79. So usually what I do is I cut the engines about this point. Uh, there's no reason wasting fuel when the periapsis is not going to get any higher than where I am right now. So the ideal is to go to the apoapsis and continue the burn to fix the orbit. So we're going to turn off SAS to preserve resources. Well, we have plenty of resources, but still, it's a good practice and then go into time warp. If you go into time warp with SAS on you will find yourself out of electric charge very quickly or monopropellant if you have RCS turned on. And so we wait. So while this is happening, you can always set up for your next maneuver. And we'll extend it. Uh, that's probably too much, but it doesn't really matter. Five, 594, 581 is good enough. That'll give you a nice little marker, time, uh, and uh, the estimated burn time that it's going to take. And let's cut the time warp off and turn it back on because it was still thinking I was below a certain altitude. And we're. This doesn't have to be exact. This is just a reminder. Usually it's. Correct thing to do is if you're going to do a burn, and particularly if it's an important burn and it's going to take a long time. When you have a ship this big, it takes a long time to turn it, particularly if you don't have a lot of, uh, if you've, but you, you know, if you put enough RCS on it, you can turn pretty much anything. But it's a good practice to get your, get your vector locked in before you reach the point where you need to burn. Um, and the blue marker on the nav ball always tells you the direction you need to, to burn in. And this is a very big ship, and it takes a lot to turn it. So it's good to prepare and set it up before you get to your, before you get to your waypoint. So back to the map. We've actually already passed it. But that's not a big deal. It's only a 22 second burn. And you can see the delta V going down as as you finish the burn. Turn SAS on if you find your marker wandering from the, its vector. And cut engines. Good enough. Okay. So now that's that that is done, we need to go back to the map. And 
actually, we were on the map, so I can go out. So you want to zoom out. There's our target. Now, what I found is that time warp is limited when you're actually in the when you're actually operating a ship. So what we're going to do is we're going to make sure everything is turned off, basically closed up, um, and we're going to exit to the space center. Make sure everything is throttled down. It actually won't let you leave. Then we need to go to the science. Because we're not going to be able to get to Duna unless Duna is properly positioned. It needs to be in at least in a, about here where the cursor is. I like to think of it as a 45 degree angle. Maybe it's a little bit more, but I usually eyeball it. So, uh, But something like this takes a, a very long time warp. And it's actually Kerbin that needs to take a, catch up to its position with Duna. Yeah, I have a lot of stuff going on. Okay. Yeah, you get a lot of science points. And pardon some of my colorful language marking some of these areas. I was excited when I actually finished some of the, some of the missions. Um, and this particular experiment orbiting curb well that's not the one there's another one that's orbiting experimental station that one was an epic failure because I forgot to put docking clamps on my or docking rings actually on the um, that module that I mentioned earlier that uh, connects to other modules so now it's just sitting in orbiting Duna and being completely useless so I'll have an extra space station around it, do not, but. And of course I've got probes that I've sent out, ion probes, um, that are still orbiting because they've either run out of fuel or run out of uh, things to do. So they're just sitting there orbiting. Now, now this is kind of tricky. And it's probably a good idea not to eyeball it, but I've done this enough times. There's enough of a fudge factor going around Kerbin that you can actually uh, fudge it a little bit. And I need to stop time warp. That's actually less of a phase angle between the planets than I'd like. I'd probably rather it be over here, but I may be able to. I might be able to make it work. We'll see if it happens. So in order to set up a Hoffman transfer, and here we are, we need to go to the map. And the best way to do this, I found, is to start a maneuver uh, what if scenario over here uh, because it's orbiting this way. And you want the, you want the exit from Kerbin to be on, toward the light, uh, toward the, the light side toward the sun because its uh, motion is that way and when you're moving with Kerbin you're, ex you're increasing its velocity relative to Kerbin in the direction of Kerbin's motion around the, the sun which means that you are going to eject into a higher orbit than the Kerbin is and hopefully in intersect Duna when Duna reaches somewhere over here. So that's why the phase angle has to be accounted for. It's about 45 degrees. I'd say that's probably uh, as, that's as close what some people call one pizza slice. However, you know, the orbits are elliptical and they're not all exact, so that angle may is not always the same. All right. So let's get to the maneuver. So as I said, over here 
and do a prograde exit in the direction uh, of Kerbin's trajectory. And as you can see, the Apple Apsis is extending almost to the to the end, to Duna. So this is where you have to sit and play with it. Sometimes you get lucky, and I didn't get lucky. I didn't get lucky at all. Okay, so let's let's move this thing over here. Maybe in parallel to the carbon. So if you get a line that's parallel to the carbon trajectory, that's uh, that that ensures that you are aligning the orbit and then straight across. And let's try this. Oh, there we go. Uh, very careful. You have to be very careful here. Okay, so first try Hoffman transfer uh, from Kerbin to Duna. Pretty easy to do. Well, it's not easy. It's sometimes it can be very annoying. You can spend 30 minutes trying to fudge these. So our burn time is Minch. It's N A, and there's a reason for that. It's because I haven't actually um, do a quick burn, and by quick I mean like so slight that it doesn't even do anything to the ship. Uh, then what it's able to do, it's able to calibrate and estimate the burn that it will take to um, for the delta v, and 900 is about right. Now the next part. Uh, turn on RCS and turn toward the vector, the blue marker on the nav ball. And if I can find it, oh, there it is. Oh, oops, passed it. Let's turn on SAS, see if it'll stabilize. Uh, we have plenty of monopropellant. Once you get the vector locked in, turn on SAS and wait for it to settle. Okay, RCS off, SAS off. Back to map. Okay, estimated burns at one minute, one minute and five seconds. That means we need to be at a T minus. We need to be at T minus thirty seconds when we start the burn at this vector. That way, we get an equal burn time around the um, around the node. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and time warp. Make sure everything is turned off. SAS and RCS is turned off. How about when you see it drop down to the minutes? Um, Three, two, one, and turn off time warp, and then get to exactly 30. That's too much. All right. Doesn't have to be exact. And if you're off the vector by a slight amount, turn on the turn up the throttle, and that way the thrust vectoring takes over, and you can start to actually steer the ship a little bit easier. Uh, this is about the time I usually turn on them. Um, I keep well, I keep the map on. Oops! Lock in the vector with SAS. Be careful. It's, it's a rookie mistake.
So you'll see our orbit pop out from the carbon orbit. Okay, there it goes. And we need to continue. And there it goes. Very slowly. Notice small amount of delta V equals a huge change in the apoapsis as it moves further away. And capture. Okay. So once you see the capture, you see the little flickering. You might as well turn this thing off. Uh, turn RCS on. Keep the prograde vector direction. And do some fine tuning with the RCS. H and N is what you want. Uh, typically, I'm pressing the N key to set the RCS to reduce uh, basically. And there it goes. See, you just pop, saw it popped on. Um, I usually get as much as I can. Uh, very small changes make for very large differences on the end. As you can see, I'm hitting the RCS in key, and that's dropping it by a million meters. So you can see where the power is of using RCS to fine-tune. However, I'm going to go ahead and time warp toward the uh, destination. So we turn off, turn off SES and RCS, and turn on time warp. A few times I've lost the uh, capture mid during the uh, round here and I suspect that one of these objects came close enough to the craft to actually affect it, to pull it out of its orbit slightly. So the Duna capture uh, area, the volume is very small um, so you have to be real careful not to lose it because sometimes it's you'll if you find yourself losing it, remember you have days of time which pass as you go along this orbit, uh, this trajectory. Uh, so you have plenty of time to do what-if scenarios and maneuvers to try to find the planet again. Uh, but it can be tedious if you didn't get it right. Okay, as you start to approach in your time warp, you got to be very careful. Hit F5 just for good measure. And start slowing that time warp down and try to get a feel for the time scale of the motion. I've, I've passed many planets zoomed right by because I accidentally hit the period instead of the comma key. So as soon as you enter the Duna SOI, which is this marker right here, shut down time warp all the way and zoom in. And as you can see, we're pretty far away. We're about 20. It says 23 mi million meters. So we're going to add a maneuver and do a retrograde maneuver to pull ourselves into a traject into a closed orbit around Duna. And actually, 194 is what I is ideal. But I'm going to nope. Let's see. 126, that sounds good. So you'll notice the estimated burn is 44 seconds. I have enough fuel to do that and more. Hopefully uh, I'll have enough fuel to get back with the eight nuclear rockets. But I will also be have a lot less weight to carry because I will have ditched this part of the craft, the science processing station, the this little uh, docking uh, adapter and the rest of this will be gone because I will have run out of fuel by the time I complete this burn. So time warp 
to about 22 seconds, estimated burn 44 seconds. And if you want to be exact, you can do it that way. But typically, I just get in close enough. As you notice, it's so we're one hour 30 minutes and drop the time warp down to one and cut it down. That's probably that's way further than I wanted, but. I should still have plenty of time to turn the to turn the craft into prograde and to get uh, burn into a an orbit around Duna. Well, let's go ahead and start the thrust. So that the thrust vectoring takes over and it's easier to steer. And lock in SAS. Almost out of fuel. Okay. Now check our coupler, make sure that's the one that's going to break off. And then activate the nuclear engines to complete. As you can see, there's a lot less power in this. But it still gets the job done. But it's very effective. And cut engine. Probably need that periapsis a little. Doing periapsis. And as a, as you can see, I accidentally got an Ike encounter in the process. It's actually pretty easy to do. So what's going to happen is that the ship is going to travel along, get captured by Ike, and then exit Ike, and then find its way, way back over here, about a million away. But let's see if I can figure out a way to get around Ike. That's actually one of the more interesting orbital situations I've ever been in. Um, I could pass by Ike and then reach periapsis at 2 million. Actually, I'm going to go with that. It's not one part of the plan, but why not? SAS and RCS off, time warp to Ike capture. Ike is the little moon that circles Duna. It's like All right, here we go, and there we are. So, I have a choice. I can either set up a burn uh, here to get into an orbit around Ike, which actually is not a bad idea. I can have my science station uh, set around Ike and uh, explore Ike as I need to. Uh, it's uh, low gravity and will take less delta V to go to and from Ike, perhaps. I don't know if that's actually true. Um, or I could uh, continue along the trajectory along the Duna periapsis and set up a, uh, a burn to get into an, a lower orbit around Duna. So either way, I've, I've uh, I have options, and both of which are very lucrative in giving you science points. And anyhow, that's the end of this video. I think it's gone long enough. Uh, there's no reason to for you to have to see the rest of this mission. It's going to be basically boring 
uh, dropping off supplies and setting up stations and then trying to figure out a way to get back. I actually do not know if I have enough uh, uh, fuel to get back to carbon. However, the phase angle uh, has to is different. Uh, and to escape from Duna and to get back to carbon, let's go to the space center. So, to get from Duna to Carbon, you actually have to wait until Duna is slightly behind uh, Carbon. And then you have to launch your craft. You have to put your craft in an orbit uh, around Duna in such the way that it, that it will uh, drop to the lower uh, orbit of carbon which means in the opposite direction at which Duna is rotating around the Sun I might set that up in the next video but for this video it's I think that's all I want to talk about thank you for watching goodbye